Good morning and welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. We're delighted to have you with us this morning for a tradition that goes back to 1960 here at King. From 1960 on, every year King faculty have selected two rising seniors to give a talk in the lecture series on something of interest to them. Sometimes it's an academic subject, sometimes it's based on a class, sometimes it's personal experience, or in this case, as you'll find, something extracurricular. Um, it has been uh, a joy to have this series throughout uh, the King Institute's history, and uh, we're delighted to have Kelsey Corley this morning. Kelsey is a history and political science major, so she has had a lot of me uh, over the course of the past couple of years, none of which should reflect uh, badly on her talk, because it'll be way better uh, than you expect in that respect. We have um, a couple of events upcoming, and I want to mention those briefly before turning it over to Emily Krug for the introduction. Next Monday, we will meet again, and it'll be music. We have the Becky Buller Band. Uh, Becky is a multiple award-winning bluegrass fiddler, singer, and songwriter. And she and her band will be here Monday morning at 9.15. She'll be at uh, the Birthplace of Country Music Museum that evening at 7. Uh, the evening event is the morning event will be streamed. The evening event is going to be ticketed or free because it's limited seating. Uh, Becky is worth a listen. If you have not heard any of her music, uh, I would urge you to go check her out, and then she'll be here in chapel next Monday. So uh, we then have a break until March 21st, with spring break shows up in there, and when we come back after spring break, we were supposed to have Holocaust survivor Peter Gorog uh, from the Bureau of Survivors uh, at the United States Holocaust Museum, Museum in DC. Uh, with public health concerns, they're not traveling at the minute. So on the 21st, we are instead going to have Milligan professor Kelly Brown, who just published a book about music and the Holocaust. So it'll still be on the same theme, and that'll be on March 21st. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Krug from the library to introduce Kelsey Corley. Good morning. In 2018, Professor Lee Jones and I led some King administrators talk us into becoming the faculty co-advisors for King's student newspaper, The KCN. For a variety of reasons, the paper was in a transitional period and had no staff, so we held some information sessions that fall to see if there were any students interested in reviving the 85-year-old publication. And that is where I first met today's speaker. I remember talking with Professor Jones after one of those meetings and saying, Kelsey seems like she'll be a good fit. Kelsey Corley is a history and political science major. She's active in the History and Political Science Club and was a member of King's Intercollegiate State Legislature de Delegation in 2019. Kelsey has been on staff for the KCN since spring of 2019. In 2020, Kelsey was named editor of the KCN which frankly meant that I've had to do a lot less work since Kelsey's leadership as editor has not only revived the publication, but has also made our weekly meetings joyful experiences. In addition to her work on the KCN, I had the pleasure of facilitating her work for an internship she completed in the Tadlock Archives, which is housed in the E.W. King Library next door. For that internship, Kelsey digitized and cataloged the sermons of Reverend James Doak Tadlock, the first president of King College. Thanks to Kelsey, you can view those sermons on the Digital Library of Appalachia, which is a collaborative project from the libraries in the Appalachian College Association. Kelsey is currently completing an internship with the Birthplace of Country Music Museum and plans to pursue a career in museums and archival work although I'd really love it if she would become a librarian instead. It is truly an honor to introduce Kelsey as our student lecturer today. Part of my job as a librarian is to help people know how to sift through all the noise in the information landscape so they can find the voices worth listening to. I don't usually tell people exactly which sources they should consult, but I'll make an exception today. You want to hear what Kelsey has to say. It is my pleasure to welcome Kelsey Corley as today's student lecturer.
Thank you so much, Emily, for that very kind introduction. Um, so as Emily discussed, uh, I started work for the KCN three and a half years ago. The paper had ceased publication the semester just before I started at King, but with the leadership of Emily Krug and Professor Lee Jones, it was organized to begin again as an online publication. Oh. Already behind. <laughs> Uh, I had no experience in news writing. Having been homeschooled throughout all of high school, I never had the opportunity to be involved in such a project. And I can admit now, years later, that I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> which becomes more evident possibly further back you look at older articles. Working with the KCN, though, has given me opportunities that no other position at King would have allowed me. I've had the chance to talk with and interview all different kinds of people, and to work with and gain an understanding of a wide variety of subjects. One thing that the KCN has struggled with for a long time has been staffing. In fact, for much of the time I have worked for the paper, I was only one of two employees. <laughs> Consequently, we don't get to spend as much time with any one given article as we would like. We plan out the publishing schedule weeks in advance and go through an almost identical process for each piece we write research, interviewing, writing lots and lots of emails, writing, editing, upload, and then you move on to the next project. I've grown accustomed to moving through this process pretty quickly, but one particular subject that I covered recently really struck out to me. Last year, I wrote an article discussing the latest report from the King Institute for Regional Economic Studies, or CHIRS which reported on the significant role that tr government transfer payments had in the regional economy. The report found that in 2019, government transfer payments accounted for 28% of the total personal income regionally, a figure that has grown significantly compared to just half a century before, in which it accounted for just around 10% on average, which begs for the research. There exists some debate over the exact borders of the region of Appalachia, and please excuse my pronunciation of the term, I'm not from this region. Um, but for our purposes today, we'll use the definition of the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is of the mountainous region that stretches from southern New York to northern Mississippi and Alabama. It is a region that has a long history of poverty. In the 1960s, it was both the inspiration and the focus of President Johnson's war on poverty. As of 2019, the federal poverty threshold in the 48 states for a family of four was an annual income of $25,750 per year. For an, an, for an individual, it was $12,500 per year. In the same year, the percentage of the population of Appalachia living in poverty, or those who earned less than those amounts, was 15.2%, larger than the national average of 11.4%. To put those numbers into a bit of perspective, the population of Appalachia is around 25.7 million people, which means that over 3 million individuals in the region lived below the poverty threshold. Oh. Okay. As found by Kyers, <laughs> government transfer payments account for a significant percentage of regional income. Simply put, in a region facing high levels of poverty, these payments are what makes the difference between paid bills and food on the table versus growing debt and empty stomachs. At such a high percentage of personal income, it is easy to conclude that with the current rate of poverty, these transfer payments are necessary for the well-being of the people in this region. Why then is the very concept of this form of income so deeply criticized within our culture? When reading the report for the first time, the careful usage of terminology surprised me. Government transfer payments are defined as payments of money from the government without the exchange of goods or services. These payments occur for a variety of reasons, but are essentially provided to those who qualify through a system of means testing. Arguably, this program could be considered synonymous or simply another example of another form of government assistance, one that can be considered rather controversial that is, welfare. Welfare in this context is defined as financial assistance provided to those in need. It is not, however, a term popularly used to describe transfer payments or similar programs because of the negative social connotations attached to it. 
One need look for no further evidence of these connotations than the deliberate absence of the word from the report. It is a term that is whispered, danced around, avoided. It is the necessary reality of so many Americans in order to survive in our modern society, and yet it is so stigmatized. I study history here at King, and many people oversimplify the field, assuming it relies entirely on the memorization of names and dates. And while those play a role in the study, they are not the subject. Learning history is about understanding cause and effect and the intricacies of human behavior. We are taught to look, look to past events or ideas and analyze how they were contemporarily interpreted and how they may continue to affect us today. So, in our exploration of the modern cultural perspective of poverty, I implore you to think like a historian. Oops, that was the Appalachian part. Sorry about that. Every student of American history knows of John Locke. Locke was an English philosopher in the 17th century, but his political philosophy reached popularity and began to be implied in the Enlightenment of the 18th century. A product of the resurgence of classicism and with a heavy emphasis on reason and the overall progress of society, the Enlightenment was characterized by scholars and academics searching for what they believed to be the state of nature or the, state, the natural state of human beings outside of historical or uh, cultural context. In his writings, The Two Treatises of Government, Locke proposed that society existed as a social contract between those that governed and those that were governed. In this contract, the public agreed to obey the state, and in turn, the state would use its power to protect the rights of life, liberty, and property of each individual, rights that Locke deemed natural and inalienable. By extension of the social contract theory, Locke proposed that the public was under no obligation to obey the state should it not uphold its end and either deny the protection of or purposely violate those rights. Locke's emphasis on the rights of the individual forms the basis of classical liberalism, not to be confused with contempor the contemporary use of the phrase, which largely refers to the greater influence and power of the state. Liberalism as an ideology prioritizes the political and economic freedom of the individual to the greatest degree possible. About 70 years after his death, Lockean philosophy would inspire the revolt of a coalition of colonies against an impressive imperial power, better known to us as the American Revolution. Liberalism and Lockean philosophy would be instrumental in the justification of the war and would serve as the foundation of political thought within the new country. It is for this reason that one cannot understand modern American culture without understanding Lockean ideology and its insistence on the rights of the individual. The prevalence of individualism within our culture was easily identifiable even early in our history. French political philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville, after witnessing failed attempts of democracy in France, traveled to the US in the early 1830s to observe and analyze the American political system in works he later published as Democracy in America. He specifically noted the prevalence of the value of individualism in different regions of the new country. Tocqueville wrote, quote, they owe nothing to any man. They expect nothing from any man. They acquire the habit of always considering themselves as standing alone, and they are apt to imagine that their whole destiny is in their own hands. A product of this concept in early American society, specifically in the settlement of Appalachia, was that of the yeoman farmer class. The yeoman was an independent landowner who lived through subsistence farming. In his work, The History of Appalachia, historian Richard B. Drake describes the yeoman ideal, which was an economy composed almost entirely of independent, self-sufficient farmers that relied on bartering and were free of taxes. The cultural significance of what, Drake's refer what Drake refers to as the yeomanesque mentality did not wane with the onset of the Industrial Revolution in the mid-19th century. Yeoman culture within America was built upon the Enlightenment ideas of individualism and liberalism, and from them evolved the values of self-sufficiency and independence from societal factors. This remains a cultural value of American culture centuries later. Chinese anthropologist Francis Hsu conducted a study of American cultural values in comparison to the values of the Chinese diaspora in the 1950s and found that the inability to be self-sufficient or to be reliant 
on others in any way, be it physically or financially, was a common fear among Americans across almost all demographics, a fear not commonly present in most Eastern cultures. The prevalence of individualism and the value of self-sufficiency within our culture have far-reaching effects on the understanding of social structures, not the least of which is our understanding of poverty. The phenomenon of economic inequality is as old as civilization itself, but the way that different cultures have interpreted and reacted to the presence of poverty is surprisingly not all that varied. In her book, Moralizing Poverty, historian Serena Romano explores the evolution of class relations and welfare throughout the dichotomy of the Protestant and Catholic traditions. In her research, Romano identifies a near universally applied classification system of the impoverished from within these cultures. They're referred to by different names, most of which we would still recognize today. These classifications are those of the deserving and the undeserving. The deserving poor have traditionally been characterized as the widow and the orphan, classical examples within the Christian tradition, but also as the crippled, the elderly, essentially all those who are unable to work, or at least to which at the rate that they would be able to fully support themselves. The mid-19th to early 20th century saw a significant expansion of this distinction to include another group, those referred to as the working poor, or those with jobs who were either underemployed or underpaid to the rate at which they could also not support themselves. In the same line of traditional thinking, the category of the undeserving poor has been comprised of anyone who did not fit into the aforementioned categories, mainly able-bodied men and women, and for most of Western history, children, who do not work. Of course, it is important to note that the understanding of work and vocation have also changed throughout history. Rarely has there been a distinction for those who seek work but are unable to find it, and those who do not. The undeserving are thus at fault for their own economic state. They are to blame for their own poverty. This categorization of the deserving and the undeserving is an attempt to balance contradictory cultural values. On the one hand, Americans value hardworking individuals who are self-reliant, who possess the yeomanesque mentality. And on the other hand, American culture is deeply entwined with the Christian tradition, the same tradition that encourages its followers to be charitable, to give all that they can to those with less. In Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Framing poverty as belonging to one of two subgroups allows for the arguably contradictory traditions to exist contemporarily. It is from this dichotomy that we inherit our understanding of welfare. In the 1950s, anthropologist Oscar Lewis conducted an ethnographical study of five impoverished families in Mexico. From, he, from his study, he concluded that the majority of those living, living in poverty all shared a similar set of values and beliefs and could thus be classified as a distinct subculture in what he would later term as the culture of poverty. Lewis's work focused not so much on the values that he found present, but on the values he found to be lacking. He argued that the poor did not place significance on the idea of success, did not value the sacrifice of present pleasure for the possibility of future security, and thus chose to spend now rather than to save for later. Lewis argued that the distinct culture was the reason behind generational poverty, and that these values were internalized from a young age, persisted into adulthood, and were thus passed on to the following generation. The culture of poverty thesis shifts the, na the narrative of blame from the individual to the community at large. This American perspective of poverty is perhaps best culminated in what I call the bootstrap myth, coming from the familiar phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. This is the over overarching ideology of our culture, that any one individual is fully capable of improving their own position in life, of achieving the American dream, they need only be willing to do so. Many people who use this phrase in discussions of economic inequality or welfare are often unaware of its original meaning. 
When the phrase first came into usage in the US around the mid-19th century, it was largely due to a, sat a satirical review of the popular novel, The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen, in which the main character manages to miraculously save himself from a precarious situation by pulling himself out of the river by his own hair, as pictured here, which the reviewer says to be as likely as the character lifting himself over a fence by the straps of his boots. In summary, it was a sarcastic remark to demonstrate impossibility. The bootstrap myth enforces the idea that poverty is a willing state of existence. It perpetuates individual or communal blame. The belief in the bootstrap myth is often weaponized in discussions of economic inequality and the institutions of welfare by framing it as either imaginary or unnecessary. According to it, Individuals choose to be impoverished. People choose to be unemployed or underemployed. People choose not to get an education. People choose to become dependent on the system. They choose this by inaction, by not lifting themselves up and out of poverty by their bootstraps. In summary, it frames poverty as a very simple black and white issue. Those who are self-reliant, who pull themselves up, are good. Those who are dependent or in need are bad. There are many who are likely eager to counter this argument that the bootstrap rhetoric is well-founded. Oops, one slide behind again. That the bootstrap rhetoric is well-founded. Indeed, Americans enjoy the rags to riches story and often over-sensationalize these narratives. Consider some popular stories from within our culture. The Great Gatsby, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Aladdin, Annie, etc. All these stories, while perhaps not entirely focused on that subject alone, are centered around an impoverished character or one living in a low social standing and end triumphantly when the character, by their own actions or feats, lifts themselves onto a much higher standard. The same sensationally hap sensationalizing happens to similar real life sc scenarios. Consider the famous story of Steve Jobs starting the wildly successful Apple company from his mother's garage. Or for an example closer to home, Dolly Parton. I thought she deserved her own slide. Coming from the deeply rooted, deeply rooted generational poverty in Appalachia and becoming one of the most successful female music artists in the country. I bring up these examples not to criticize the individuals, but instead to critique the idealization of their unique experiences. Many people point to these figures and use their stories as justification for the bootstrap myth, and with the, with the idea that if they could do it, anyone could. All of this is to say that prevalent segments of American culture view poverty as a personal failing. It is the unwillingness to do what is necessary to overcome and to pull oneself up to a higher economic standing. Those who live in poverty do so willingly, and thus they embody the undeserving poor. The understanding of this ideology is important to conceptualizing the subsequent demonization of the poor, and specifically those who rely on welfare. To accept welfare, or charity, is to break a cultural standard in American society. Let's instead examine the alternative perspective. Instead of focusing on the cultural narrative surrounding poverty and the discourse of exactly who is deserving and why, Let's first try to understand some structural explanations for why there are such significant numbers of people living with less than they need. Again, let's think like a historian. There is perhaps no better example of how these cultural perceptions of poverty affect real world policy than that of the legislation of 1996, which according to President Bill Clinton, was the end of welfare as we know it. The Aid to Families with Dependent Children was a, re was a New Deal program enacted in 1935 to provide federal assistance to families with little or no income. The program was mainly motivated by the desire to preserve traditional family roles, specifically to keep single white women at home, single white mothers at home and out of the workforce. Black women and their families were excluded from this program until the 1960s. With their inclusion, the demographics of the program shifted due to higher rates of poverty among African Americans in comparison to their white counterparts. Thus, the program began to face backlash from proponents of the bootstrap myth, specifically with racial motivations, with the intent to equate black Americans with the undeserving poor. 
This change would be exploited by Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign in the 1970s, in which he would claim there was an abundance of welfare fraud perpetrated by those he referred to as welfare queens, a caricature of a woman, typically black, who was too lazy to work and thus abused the system for personal profit. In 1983, a study conducted under the Department of Justice seemed to confirm Reagan's claims, as it reported annual overpayments, which totaled to significant amounts. Looking further into the study, however, uncovers that these cases of fraud were not perpetrated by people living in, under the poverty threshold, who were content with their unemployment and living off their meager government assistance. Instead, the majority of the fraud was committed by members of the middle class and local officials, skimming off the top for personal gain. By Clinton's time in the 1990s, AFDC was criticized on two fronts, that fraud was rampant in the system and that those who were receiving benefits were becoming too dependent, which, when argued together, almost seem contradictory. In the same breath, these critics claimed that the, pro the program was both too necessary and unnecessary. At the end of his first term, President Clinton passed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which effectively ended this form of federal welfare, instead allowing control to go to the states. In conjunction, the administration passed TANF, or the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. The most notable difference between these two programs was that where AFDC sought to keep women at home, TANF required their presence in the workforce. It created work requirements for aid and caps on how long any individual could receive benefits. Originally hailed as a success, this legislation, in theory, seems beneficial, even a feminist victory. In practice, however, it has removed the social safety net of millions. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, due to the strict income qualifications, only one in three families living below the federal poverty threshold qualify to receive benefits. While the program requires participants to be employed, it does little to actually aid individuals in finding such work, as it is only mandated to provide what is referred to as job search and readiness assistance for only four weeks. While poverty rates increased drastically following the recession of 2008, TANF was largely unresponsive, and the number of recipients of benefits hardly went up. The replacement of AFDC with TANF is the perfect example of how the rhetoric of deservedness can be damaging. Another structural explanation can be found in the modern definition of poverty, or specifically how it is calculated. The official means of calculating poverty came as a product of President Johnson's War on Poverty legislation. In 1964, Molly Orshansky, an economist working for the Social Security Administration developed what is referred to as the OPM, or the Official Poverty Measure. Orshansky calculated the lowest cost of food for the minimum nutritional diet and multiplied that cost by three and then adjusted for family size. This method was based off of a study from 1955, which found that most households spent about one third of their income on food. Those with, the, with an annual income before taxes lower than that number were determined to be living below the poverty threshold. Although there have been numerous attempts to improve the Orshansky method over the decades since its creation, it is essentially the same model which we continue to use today as the OPM. This was developed, however, in 1964, when food was generally more expensive than today relative to the percentage of income spent. According to the USDA in 2020, the average American household spent only about 8.6% of their annual income on food, far below the 33% that the Orshansky method was designed for. In contrast, Americans today spend approximately 37% of their annual income on housing, a drastic increase from the average of around 22% in the 1960s. In summary, the official means of defining poverty is designed based off of one of the lowest annual household expenses with complete disregard to what is today one of the highest expenses. Throughout American history, there have been two primary methods of social socioeconomic mobility, one of which we have already examined in the yeoman farmers of Appalachia. Up until the market revolution, the ownership of land was seen as the means of economic security. Land owned by individual families was used for subsistence farming, 
and while often not economically prosperous, these families could usually produce enough to feed themselves and meet their basic needs. Following the market revolution of the 19th century, the economy shifted from one of an agrarian society to one more closely resembling our modern capitalist system. Following that shift, many individuals left farming to pursue factory work, and with it, most of the economy became reliant on what is considered low-skill work. It was at this time that the means of securing economic stability switched from owning land to developing a high trade skill. This development, however, is only possible with an education. Today, a college education is considered the main path to economic stability. Indeed, that is why many, if not all of us, are here today. As romantic as the idea of learning for the sake of learning is, the majority of students are here not for their love of knowledge, but for the opportunity to improve or just maintain their socioeconomic status. A degree provides the very bootstraps by which we are to lift ourselves. Education, however, remains a privilege. The structuring of student loans and the predatory, predatory manner by which they are pushed onto young adults have culminated in a student debt crisis. In 2020, approximately 32% of American adults were college graduates. In the same year, 30% of American adults were in debt from student loans, with a total of about $1.7 trillion of debt resting on the shoulders of just 45 million Americans. While there exist many forms of financial aid, colleges and universities still have a long way to come in terms of accessibility and affordability. Today, attending university may be the best way to get a thorough education and secure a high value skill in the modern economy. But due to the cost and the likelihood of incurring significant debt, it no longer provides the same level of security that it once did. America is not unique in the phenomenon of basing public policy on cultural perceptions. It is unique, however, among other developed nations, in leaving the policy of welfare up to politicians instead of economic experts. Politics, unfortunately, rarely focuses on objective fact, but instead on public opinion. Often, popular legislation is passed, and unpopular legislation is abandoned, which is democratic, but opinion relies heavily on perception. By focusing on our historical and cultural perspectives of poverty and the overall belief in the boost bootstrap myth, we inhibit any effective legislation or reform of welfare and thus perpetuate poverty. It becomes then our responsibility as we enter adulthood and the real world, as citizens and as voters, to reevaluate our cultural legacy, to be mindful of our perceptions and how we as individuals contribute to the continuance of inequality and injustice. Thank you very much. When you teach at a college, one of the joys is to hear the moments when your students teach you. And I've had the opportunity to read this paper in various drafts, and every time it has impressed me with its thoughtfulness, its ability to muster material from all kinds of things. We went from John Locke to economic policy to Dolly Parton. And in spite of the mispronunciation of the word Appalachia, um, <laughs> I think Kelsey did an admirable job of thinking like a historian and reflecting exactly what King is all about, which is graduating students who are thoughtful, resourceful, and responsible citizens. So please join me again in thanking Kelsey for today's student lecture. And you're dismissed.